eh, buonasera, buonasera. Eh, stasera parliamo in compagnia della nostra Elena Silvestri e del eh, dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo, eh, naturalmente di spalla, in particolare dell'uscita di spalla che interessa moltissimi giovani, meno giovani, è un argomento condiviso e cerchiamo di capire stasera come si affronta l'uscita di spalla nelle varie parti del mondo, per cui siamo collegati veramente con varie parti del mondo perché abbiamo no? Nobu Yamamoto che è collegato per esempio dal Giappone, Matteo Provence, eh, Philippe Moroder e Philippe Valenti, però ehm, dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo ci spieghi e ci introduca un attimo bene ehm, l'argomento di questa serata. Allora, uh, buonasera a tutti innanzitutto e ringrazio i miei amici a livello internazionale che tra lavoro e fuso orario in questo momento stanno facendo un grosso sforzo, so per esempio che Matt Provence eh, ha le visite che lo stanno attendendo e ancora peggio, Nomo Yamamoto sono le 2 o 3 di notte in Giappone quindi vi ringrazio in modo particolare chiaramente ringrazio Filippo eh, Moroder e Filippo Valenti che sono un po' più vicini a noi in questo momento l'uscita di spalla chiaramente è il termine che si usa eh, in gergo però parliamo della instabilità della spalla che è un argomento particolarmente scontante molto all'avanguardia e ricco anche di tanti studi e di tante eh, innovazioni entreremo quindi in questo nel dettaglio con quattro che sono ritenuti tra i più esperti dal punto di vista sia chirurgico che di ricerca mi viene poco non vorrei dire internazionale ma veramente a livello mondiale tra di loro non so quanti articoli quanti congressi quanti pazienti quanta esperienza pratica e teorica hanno nella loro storia professionale e quindi fra pochissimo passeremo la parola per primo all'ospite Matt Provencer che verrà introdotto da Vira però ci tenevo e mi dispiace purtroppo che l'amico Jem Hesh, che è un chirurgo conosciuto a livello mondiale, specialista in particolare eh, sulla spalla, è conosciuto proprio perché organizza un convegno che quest'anno, ho l'onore di essere tra, nella faculty, tra l'altro è il quarantesimo anno che il nostro amico eh, Jem Hesh organizza questo eh, convegno, che si terrà a Coronado tra qualche settimana, il, tra il 14 e il 17 giugno, in California. E si parla di tanti argomenti importanti, ma qual è il grosso riconoscimento che va dato a questo personaggio, a Jem Hash, che sono sicuro che in questo momento ci sta ascoltando? Il grosso riconoscimento che va dato a Jem Hash è che molti di noi e probabilmente anche molti degli ospiti eh, che sono presenti eh, stasera devono molto della loro ispirazione, della loro professionalità, dello stimolo che mettono sui pazienti nella ricerca scientifica proprio a Jem Hash. Jem Hash ha avuto l'abilità di coagurare nel mondo una serie di leader, ma parliamo già di 40 anni fa, ha visto, ha letto nel futuro delle possibilità chirurgiche e non solo, anche riabilitative della spalla, e quindi chirurghi di tutto il mondo ogni anno da qualunque parte, dall'Australia, dall'India, dall'Europa, dal Sud America, da tutto il mondo, vanno in flotte, centinaia, sono normalmente 500-600 gli iscritti che da 40 anni imparano e in modo particolare vengono illuminati da tutta la faculty che eh, Jim Hash riesce eh, a mettere insieme annualmente. Quest'anno per esempio ci sono delle novità, si parlerà e si parla tantissimo nell'ambito della patologia chirurgica, della patologia del trattamento chirurgico della spalla dei tendon transfer tra l'altro abbiamo avuto anche ospite il leader in discusso eh, insieme a valenti a livello internazionale che è bassem halassan che farà vedere proprio le diverse tecniche dei, dei transfer ma in questo convegno che si tiene a coronado tra il 14 e il 17 giugno si parlerà anche non solo agli ortopedici ma si parlerà per esempio ai fisioterapisti ai medici di base che comunque devono e rappresentano un punto di forza nella comunicazione con l'ortopedico si parlerà di eh, spalla eh, protesica in particolare interesse sono le protesi inverse abbiamo un ospite di eccezione conosciuto in tutto il mondo che è christian gerber si parlerà di instabilità argomento che affronteremo eh, questa sera con un altro grosso esperto che è il dottor eh, sugaia anche lui dal giappone un'altra volta probabilmente ospite d'onore eh, christian gerber lenny johnson altri argomenti riguardano 
un altro capitolo particolarmente all'avanguardia che è quello di tutta la tecnologia che viene oggi impiegata sulla protesi che in particolare mi riferisco alla realtà virtuale, alla robotica che comincia a essere applicato ormai non solo sul ginocchio ma ci siano, ci siano dei trend che vanno verso la risoluzione o il tentativo di aiutare i chirurghi sul campo o chirurgico vuoi con la robotica e per la spalla in particolare con la realtà virtuale. Si parlerà chiaramente anche di successi della chirurgia ma cosa più importante è quella dove noi siamo ahimè abituati a imparare anche dagli insuccessi quindi dei chirurghi coraggiosi da tutto il mondo faranno vedere gli insuccessi come possono essere prevenuti e come si può uscire dall'insuccesso. Quindi ringraziamo per l'ennesima volta eh, il nostro amico che in questo momento è in California, Jam Hash, per eh, questa grossa opportunità di crescita che dà a tutti eh, gli amanti di questa patologia. Grazie eh, Jim. Quindi passo la parola a a che il nostro primo ospite. Sì, che è il dottor Matthew Provenza e naturalmente il focus eh, sarà proprio eh, la prima eh, lussazione di spalla, l'algoritmo terapeutico nella instabilità antero inferiore recidivanti. Eh, due parole sul dottor Provenza, chirurgo della spalla, naturalmente del ginocchio, dello eh, sport presso la rinomata Sedman Clinic eh, di Vail in Colorado. Ricordiamo che lui è autore, docente, ricercatore e educatore molto coinvolto nelle tecniche di artroscopia ortopedica e nella prevenzione di infortuni. Pensate poi eh, che eh, negli Stati Uniti è stato eh, indicato come uno dei 28 eh, migliori chirurghi eh, della eh, spalla. Eh, ma a che ore sono adesso? Luna di pomeriggio, dove lei? Buona... Buongiorno, buongiorno, è luna di pomeriggio, ci sente? Good afternoon, Giovanni, how are you? It is 1 p.m., Vail, Colorado. <coughs> Welcome, I know it's evening for many of you and early morning for Japan, but thank you all, it's great to be here and uh, the amazing channel you have, it's great to see so many friends and thank you for the kind invitation. This, uh... Ecco, ricordiamo poi anche, chiedo scusa, io non ho un grandissimo ritorno audio, però volevo ricordare che il dottor Provenza è stato eh, direttore medico e medico capo della squadra del New England Patriots, una squadra naturalmente rinomatissima, conosciutissima in tutto il mondo ed era mh, responsabile tra l'altro di circa 75 professionisti medici eh, che seguono naturalmente ovunque questa, eh, questa squadra. Eh, a questo punto, dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo, vogliamo eh, cominciare con una sua domanda? Al... Ma più che altro io darei la parola a, a Matthew Provencer che ci dovrà parlare proprio del primo episodio di instabilità, delle lesioni anatomopatologiche e com'è l'approccio eh, in particolare negli Stati Uniti perché esistono a livello internazionale diverse filosofie. Quindi eh, Matt, se ci spieghi un pochettino... Eh, bene, com'è l'approccio conservativo chirurgico, il timing chirurgico nella first time dislocation? Benvenuto e grazie. Giovanni, thank you. I have some slides to share, if that's okay. We can go through uh, the algorithm and to fix or not to fix. So thank you for the invitation. So why do we fix these? There's a lot of historical data that says you may not need to fix it. There are many times you may not have this, but we know there's a lot of factors that have to be considered. Sex, age, what type of sport, collision, non-collision. But when you're looking at non-operative versus operative, these are the people that you really have to be, be concerned. Males, 3.5 times likely to have recurrence. If you're less than 40, not just 18 or 20, when you look at NEARS and other data, It's actually much higher than that. <clears throat> People are active, they're more active later in life, and 40% will experience a recurrent dislocation when you look at all of every, all the instability literature put together. Now, if you look at Sandy Kirkley's work, which was amazing, in 1999, she did a randomized study looking at whether you should stabilize arthroscopically or treat non-operatively, a first-time dislocation. Guess what? Arthroscopic stabilization leads to better outcomes than mobilization. Better WOSI scores, less recurrence, 
Uh, you know, unfortunately, Sandy passed away in a plane crash before she could finish a lot of her work. But this is many of the things we are seeing now again and again. When you look at prospective, now randomized trials, non-operative treatment results in a high rate of recurrence in those patients that are deemed to have a high rate of recurrence. Males younger than 30 to 40, those that have contact sports or pseudo contact sports, operative treatment leads to better outcomes. But there are people you can certainly get away with with not treating it. If you go back to John Aaronin's work at the Naval Academy, this is actually where I went to college and they did a lot of great work in instability. You had five weeks of immobilization, you could decrease your immobilization down to 17%. Now these were not followed long term, but you actually could get that down to about 20-25% recurrence rate. So not bad, but overall still quite a bit of uh, instability. Well, what about the question of external rotation? And if you look at uh, yeah, many work here and certainly have to thank uh, Etoy and Yamamoto's group here on the call. It's certainly done a lot of great work when you see what happens in the abducted external position in cadaver, cadaver studies. Ear mobilization increases this glenoid labrum contact forces and you get better labrum height, better labrum contact. And so this was thought to be a very good rationale. I will say most of my colleagues in the United States don't use that. Uh, but if you look at a systematic review of high-level studies, whether you do external rotation or scope stabilization, arthroscopic stabilization was again a lower rate of recurrence, but it wasn't bad if you did external rotation mobilization. You definitely got a few percentage points increase uh, in terms of overall recurrence. The problem is some people wear the sling and don't like the sling and external rotation, and there are certainly some concerns, and that's really I think where we've been in the United States is the sling has been hard to wear, although the science may back it up. Well, how do you do an in-season athlete, and if it's rugby or football or American sport, uh, many others here, if you have a contact or pseudo-contact sport, is it safe for them to return in season? Well. You probably can get away with it. You can compete. And if you look at Dan Buss's work, he did a great job that said rehab and bracing coming back after 2.5 weeks, you can get back and you're able to return and complete your season. However, a lot had a recurrence during that season. And that's the issue because uh, if you're going to go on to recurrence, we're going to talk about recurrence because there is a cost. If you look at the uh, West Point and Naval Academy study, many were able to get back. 45 contact, contact athletes within the season. Most athletes were able to come back, but again, many of these patients did go on to a recurrent uh, or to a recurrence. 64 percent so anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 percent are going to recur during the season and you get an average of not just one but two instability events for that return season so what are the risks well they're there and this is what you have to educate your patients and or athlete on there are there is a cost to recurrence and we talk about this all the time. We fix ACL surgeries in the knee all the time. We don't let them go back to play and go back to sport, but maybe because the, we don't walk on the shoulder or pivot on the shoulder, we let people go back in the shoulder. And I'm not sure 100% why, but if you look at this very good study from Takeda and all, and all is 167 shoulders more instability episodes, very clear association with greater bone loss, greater incidence of osteoarthritis, and you had more soft tissue lesions, more extensive labrum tears, more uh, alpsa tears, more extensive labrum lesions, all of these if you had more than one recurrence. And if you had primary again versus recurrence, what about the hill sacs and bony lesions? Much higher, more hill sacs, more bone loss. And we know that there's more bone loss. Giovanni has shown us this, along many others, that bipolar lesions, if you have bipolar lesions, you've had more instability events. So there's clearly a cost to recurrence, and more instability events are more of these loss, and this is typically what we find, and these were our cohort of 200 instability patients. 5% had more of this acute bone injury. Most of them were in this attritional bone loss, two to seven episodes, and more than 10 episodes was very severe, 30 to 45%. So last, lastly, I just want to talk the other things we see with recurrence, and it's very clear we have all of these things happening if you have a recurrent injury. And so 
more bone, more bone loss and more labral tears. If you look at Shin's work, there's no question you get more prevalence of labrum tears. If you look at others, Dickens, Zhang, and others, if you have recurrence, 13.5% or more, no recurrence or N of 1 instability event, less than 13.5 on average. You get larger hill sacs lesions, more recurrence, and it confounded the instability. More capsular injuries, more capsular stretch, more capsular volume that shows up after instability. And this is our article that looked at uh, if you had anterior with recurrence, you had a much higher volumetric arthrogram ability to put in pressure limited arthrogram fluid. So we know that the capsular stretch was there when you had recurrence. You also have more GLAD tears, more ALPSA, and more cartilage lesions. And we do know that uh, ALPSAs and GLAD lesions are actually not good in terms of arthroscopic stabilizations. The recurrences are much higher. And if you look at uh, our work here, ALPSA had twice the amount of bone loss. You also had uh, more, uh, more risk factors for off-track lesions and other issues. I just lastly want to talk, it was asked about treatment algorithm. Well, we know how to do this really well. And uh, thank you, Dr. Yamamoto and others for giving us the glenoid track concept. It's wonderful uh, because we can't think about the glenoid in isolation. We have to think about a bipolar lesion. And we're learning a lot from this. This is a cadaver study, but it's uh, actually easy to remember. And we're actually now clinically validated this in numerous studies. Uh, we looked at this back in 2013, where we actually validated this and looked at uh, clinical application for uh, anterior instability and we're really able to predict recurrence when using these uh, simple measurements of the glenoid track and then Giovanni and others have shown us a lot about this in terms of how they're additive and what to do in 2022 and Giovanni thank you for these wonderful videos and pictures to help us understand this better but in essence, if you're less than 25%, and this number is probably controversial now, given that this, I think it's going down more and more, maybe it's 15% or 20%, but on track, arthroscopic, off track, maybe arthroscopic plus remplissage, and there's certainly argument to add remplissage to everything now because of the much better, uh, re less recurrence rate. And if you're much higher, you're looking at ladder J and or free bone graft. And certainly here in the United States, I know other places that have access, the distal tibia has been a wonderful graft for us to really make match the shoulder well, and as well as adding in the talus for larger heel sacs lesion and tailor plugs or tailor slices. So when you're fixing this by scope, we want to make sure we're doing this uh, arthroscopically well. You can see this is a very big lesion here, but when you're doing this uh, overall in the bank cart, and remplissage recurrence rate and latter J recurrence rate, but bank heart and remplissage you can get quite well. And latter J, the more you look at it, the more you investigate it in the literature, it's really good. But when you look at the recurrence, latter J recurrence is probably anywhere from four to fifteen percent. It's not uh, as good as we may think. It's it's very good, but we still I think have work to do and really understanding who needs what. So in conclusion. Uh, there is a cost to recurrence, and you may want to stabilize your athlete earlier because there is a cost. Things happen. Most athletes can return to sport, and a lot of them will want to, and so those are individual decisions. But when you have recurrence, you get more le bony lesions, more bone loss, more labrum tears, more off-track lesions. And with that, I want to thank you for your time, and Giovanni, I appreciate you putting this together. It's an honor. Grazie a te Matta, ti rubo ancora due minuti perché ho una domanda da farti. Io sono Reduce, sono arrivato stanotte da New Orleans dove c'era eh, Lana e sono rimasto eh, impressionato anche fav favorevolmente dall'utilizzo che il remplissage eh, sta ehm, prendendo in questi ultimi anni. Ho notato con interesse, poi ne discuteremo magari anche in un'altra sede, come il remplissage viene applicato non solo alla classica Bancart, la Bancart Plus, ma addirittura tanti colleghi che sono affezionati al bon block riescono ad abbinare il remplissage al bon block e addirittura esiste una frangia di colleghi che fanno il remplissage più la latargè. Questo chiaramente è un argomento estremamente interessante che fa vedere comunque come molti di noi abbiano fiducia in questo gesto di riempimento della valle della Hill Sachs. Ma la mia domanda che ti voglio fare, prego di far partire il video, riguarda eh, Matt le Boni Bancart. Noi stiamo facendo, abbiamo fatto degli studi insieme sulle Boni Bancart, cioè quando si ha il fragment type, per esempio il pattern del fragment type, si distacca non solo l'apparato capsulo legamentoso, ma anche un frammento d'osso. 
Perché è interessante eh, questa quest, quest, quest osservazione? Sono curioso di sapere come la pensa Marta. Come si comporta in un primo episodio con una Boni Bankart? Perché diversi studi degli amici giapponesi e non solo hanno fatto vedere come questo frammento d'osso in un anno di attesa si riduce addirittura del 50%. Quindi riparare in ritardo un paziente vuol dire comunque avere un frammento più piccolo e quindi avere una piattaforma eh, chiaramente eh, minore e quindi una lesione che può essere più facilmente off track. Senza scordare che aspettare, come dicevi giustamente tu, può comportare anche un maggior numero di dislocazioni e queste dislocazioni chiaramente interferiscono col glenoid bone loss. Qual è la tua filosofia quando hai una first time dislocation e una bony bankart, Matt? Giovanni, first of all, congratulations on that wonderful video. This is something you and I have talked many times about, which is the attritional bone loss, ABL, not just glenoid bone loss, but attritional bone loss, which we found can set in as early as six to eight weeks after an instability event. And that's a huge problem because you think you have that bone that can reconstruct the glenoid, but it's not there. And even if it's there, it's very soft. So to your question, I like fixing these early. And in fact, that's why, at least on the NFL field, the football field in the United States, We have x-rays at all the stadium. If they have a shoulder injury, dislocation, et cetera, they're probably not coming back in the same game, but the x-ray right away can help us decide if they need surgery or not. Why? You have a bony fragment. If they have a bony fragment, for me, it's surgery right away and they're not coming back because we can get a beautiful repair and or repair of that anatomic fragment using a variety of techniques, all anchor techniques, anchor plus small handles compression screws or whatever you like to use in a very nice arthroscopic manner and you're able to reconstruct it. In addition, uh, the hill sacs generally is pretty small because you haven't had recurrence. So whether or not you had a remplissage into the head is controversial but it's a very good it's a very good topic and I've done a lot of remplissage with with bone procedures as well so that's a whole nother topic but certainly something to think about but I like fixing these early Matt ti ringraziamo ti salutiamo da Roma ci incontreremo a San Diego fra qualche settimana e ti ringrazio per l'ennesima volta eh, per la ciao. tua grande Io disponibilità thank you. Ciao. Ciao, 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 ciao ciao Matt buonasera grazie buonasera grazie anche per tutte queste informazioni che diventano sempre più chiare man mano che noi facciamo serate come queste anche per chi come me non è un chirurgo della spalla. Adesso invece ci colleghiamo, anzi è collegato il dottor Nobu eh, Yamamoto, ehm, buonasera, lei è consulente presso il Dipartimento di Chirurgia Ortopedica a Tohoku University School of Medicine dal 2009, mi pare che è professore professore associato, ha vinto moltissimi premi, 22, tra cui il miglior poster dell'American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery e il miglior poster della società europea del gomito e della spalla, SECEC. Tra l'altro ha pubblicato 131 articoli scientifici, 63 libri capitoli, 54 recensioni, 92 forum, insomma veramente un lavoro attivissimo. E, Prima di dare eh, la parola al dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo, volevo ricordare che sono le 4 del mattino, giusto da lei? Come ha dormito qualche ora? Yes. Eh sì? <ride> ma, oh, yeah, yeah, I did. <ride> <ride> ma che cosa pensa di fare? Poi quando chiudiamo il collegamento che fa? Si rimette a dormire oppure riparte con le sue attività? Uh, I want to go to bed again. <ride> <ride> bene, bene. <ride> Dottor Giacomo. Bene. Nobu, io, io, Nobu, io ti ringrazio e adesso vi faccio sorridere, mi scuso pubblicamente con Nobu perché nelle mie follie sulla spalla ogni tanto durante il weekend o durante la giornata mando degli improbabili email a Nobu volendo discutere con lui insieme al nostro amico Ichi Toy sul fragment type, sulle fracture, sulla version type e devo dire che c'è sempre da imparare ed è sempre molto stimolante confrontarsi con Nobu e con Igi. Ti ringrazio Nobu e ti lascio la parola sulla biomeccanica dell'instabilità glenomerale. Grazie ancora.
Okay, I will share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, I'm Nobuyuki Yamamoto from Tokyo University in the Japan. It's my great honor to talk about shoulder biomechanics. This is a video of the wrestling game. Please look at the uh, red player. He was strong. He has a dislocation at this time. Very painful. In his case, dislocation position is elevation position. It is generally believed dislocation position is abduction and external rotation position, but it's not always true. There are many dislocation positions. Look at the literature. The Schwab reported most common dislocation position was hyperflexion or abduction, 36%. Abduction and external rotation was just 21%. So mid-range injury is more common than we expected. Arthroscopic bunker repair is a very much reasonable procedure because we repair essential lesion. Look at the literature. Recurrence rate is very good, less than 20%. Our clinical data also showed a good clinical result. The current rate was 6%. There was a shocking paper for me when I was a young doctor. Buckhout reported even after bunker repair, if patient has an embodied pear glenoid, which means large glenoid defect, the current rate is very high, 67%. But why unstable even after bunker repair? During bunker repair, we repair the essential region. To answer this question, let's think about the shoulder stability. Shoulder stability depends on the arm position. There are two positions, end range and mid range. End range is abduction and external rotation. Mid range is other position. At the end range, ligament became towed and contributed to the stability. IGHL became towed and prevent femoral head translate anteriorly. If there is a bunker lesion, femoral head dislocate anteriorly like this. On the other hand, at the mid range, ligament is lax. It doesn't contribute to the stability. Instead for that, interarticular pressure and muscle contribute to the stability at the mid range. In this video, the, the needle is inside the joint. If I open the three way stop cock, the mirror head dislocates inferiorly. By this simple experiment, we are able to know that interarticular pressure contributes to the stability. Another Stabilizing mechanism is concavity compression effect. Femoral head is compressed to the glenoid concavity by rotator cuff muscles. It is well known the glenoid is a very much the shallow concavity. We measure the glenoid depth, it's just 2.4 millimeter. But this shallow glenoid concavity is important in terms of the shoulder stability. If there is a glenoid defect, femoral head dislocate anteriorly at the mid range. That's why if patient has a embodied pure glenoid, large glenoid defect, the current rate is very high. Glenoid defect and heel sac lesion are common injury associated with anterior shoulder instability and its incidence is very high, 86% and 94% respectively. Bipolar lesion is a combination of the glenoid defect and the heel sac lesion.
And its incense is also very high, 81%. We need to consider bone loss in addition to the soft tissue. When considering treatment of the glenoid defect, we just think about glenoid defect because it is related to the mid-range stability. At the mid-range, ligament is lax, so we just consider the glenoid defect. On the other hand, when considering the treatment of the shield sac lesion, we need to consider the bipolar lesion. This heel sac lesion is safe because which is located within contact area, no risk of engagement. However, if there is a glenoid defect, engagement occur easily. So we, we need to consider the bipolar lesion like this. So how to evaluate a heel sac lesion? If you evaluate your engagement during surgery, it's not correct because before bunker repair, femoral head translates anteriorly easily and the engagement occur easily. Look at the literature. If you evaluate the engagement during surgery, its incidence is very high, 27% to 43%. We should evaluate the risk of engagement before surgery. So how to evaluate a heel sac lesion? Virus of the heel sac lesion? This heel sac lesion is very wide, but no risk of engagement. How about depth? This heel sac lesion is deep, but no risk of engagement. The most important point is relative location of the medial margin of the heel sac lesion. We have proposed the concept of the glenoid tract. Glenoid tract is a zone of contact of the glenoid on the female head. The virus of the glenoid tract was demonstrated to be 83% of the glenoid virus in vivo MRI study. We can evaluate the glenoid defect and the heel sac lesion together. In the literature, glenoid defect and heel sac lesion are considered separately. However, if you use a glenoid tract concept, we are able to evaluate both lesions at the same time. Giovanni developed this concept and he named the engaged heel sac lesion of track lesion and no engaging heel sac lesion of track lesion. Now there are two types of the glenoid defect, fragment type and erosion type. Erosion type, is it really bony erosion? If so, there should be no wear debris. But we have never seen such a wear debris in the CT image. Look at the literature. There are many studies describing the shoulder dislocation, but few descriptions about the mechanism of bone loss. Then we perform the biomechanical study. Now, first, we need to develop the dislocation device. This is custom dislocation device, intense fire, magnetic sensor, and the air compressor. We use the air cylinder. By using this air cylinder, we are able to apply maximum 100 program at high speed, 500 millimeter per second. Down, knee, each. And the female head is cooled by the 800 newton. Down, knee. Finally, we could successfully create a dislocation model bony bunker lesion and heel sac lesion and glenoid defect. And uh, this is a bony fragment. The glenoid limb was pulled by the IGHL, so always the same location as the attachment of the IGHL. IGHL is attached to the glenoid bone loss, bone, and the abrasion type and the fragment type is a different. Abulsion type, the shape of the abulsion type is always including the smallest articular surface of the bone. Here are data of the 15 shoulder in our series. 60% bunker lesion, 
27% Bonnie Bunkert, and 13% Capsular Tear. Fragment type can be divided into two, fracture type and aversion type. Fracture type. During dislocation, granular limb fracture occur. But aversion type is different. Keeping central peter position, Kumer head compressed to the granoid, and the horizontal extension is forced. And then the granoid limb was pulled by the IGHL and the aversion fracture occur. So fracture type and aversion type, different uh, injury mechanism each other. This is fluoroscopy image of the aversion type. You can see the fragment here. Is bone loss created during dislocation? If so, anterior margin of the granoid should be curved. But it's not curved. It's always straight in the 3D CT image like this. So we hypothesize bone loss is created after dislocation, not during dislocation. After dislocation, Kumer head is compressed to the granoid, Husak region is created, and granular limb is also compressed. We confirmed it in a biomechanical study. Then finally created the granoid uh, compression fracture, and we performed the histologic analysis. This is HS staining, posterior and anterior. You can see the cortex here and the collapse of the trabecular bone. Also, you can see the fracture line. In our ex uh, institute, uh, we have our animal experiment center. There, micro CT device they have. This is micro CT image, posterior and anterior. And you can see the collapse of the trabecular bone. So this is not erosion, but a compression fracture. In summary, a large bone loss is a risk factor for recurrence. When think about the treatment of the Husak lesion, we should consider the bipolar lesion. And the granoid tract concept is useful. Erosion type granular bone loss is not erosion, it's a compression fracture. And we propose another type of the granular fragment, a version type. Thank you for your attention. Eh, grazie, grazie a lei. Devo chiederle una cosa, di aspettare un pochino per tornare a letto perché vorrei che lei rimanesse fino alla fine di questa <ride> serata per rispondere a qualche domandina. Eh, che dice? Ce la possiamo fare? Oh, okay. yes, sure. È un sì. I will wait. È un sì. Bene, bene, bene. <ride> da, perfetto. Cerchiamo di, cercheremo di non annoiarla. E a questo punto ci eh, colleghiamo con il professor Philip Moroder, chirurgo della spalla e del gomito presso la clinica Schaltes di Zurigo, in Svizzera. Buonasera. E, mh, Ricordiamo specializzato in chirurgia della spalla e del gomito dopo aver partecipato alla SECEC Traveling Fellowship in diversi centri d'eccellenza negli Stati Uniti. Dal 2018 al 2021 è stato direttore del Dipartimento di Chirurgia eh, della Spalla e del Gomito presso l'ospedale universitario Charité di Berlino e il ha ricevuto anche numerosissimi riconoscimenti per le sue ricerche e dal 2021 fa parte del comitato esecutivo della European Shoulder and Album Society, della, quindi della SECEC. Um, a questo punto, dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo, a lei. Beh, prego, Filippo, lui lo sa, Filippo, la stima che nutro eh, in Filippo, lui ha fatto veramente tantissime pubblicazioni, ha messo anche ordine, ha fatto eh, delle classificazioni, ha sviluppato eh, l'interesse scientifico intorno all'instabilità posteriore, quindi sono onorato di cederti la parola e grazie ancora una volta per la tua presenza. Grazie Filippo. 
Good evening, dear friends in Rome. Uh, thank you especially to Giovanni for inviting me for a second time to be part of a Shoulder Channel TV event. It's wonderful what you built there, my friend. So let me dive into my slides for one second. So let's see. So I hope you can see my slides that is started. Otherwise, please interrupt me and let me know. Yeah. So to start off, I would like to point out some disclosures uh, as I might be a little bit conflicted during parts of my talk, and I would like to point this out. So sometimes in clinical practice, we observe patients that dislocate their shoulder, not only when they have a trauma, but every time when they raise their hand. And you can clearly see this on the fluoroscopic image on the upper right hand side. However, as opposed to the problems that were shown by Noble and Matt Provencher before, you cannot see anything on MRI. There's no structural defect at all, yet this patient have the most severe type of instability that you witness in your clinical practice. So the question remains, why can this happen? If there's no structural defects, why are these patients so unstable? And the explanation is that we often do not consider the muscles. So in cases where there is muscle hyperactivity or muscle hyperactivity, this can lead to a very severe type of shoulder instability. And I like to call this functional shoulder instability as opposed to structural shoulder instability that my colleagues talked about before. Who is affected? It's mostly teenagers and young adults, and the prevalence is quite high. We did a study and found 0.5 to 2.6% of the medical university students are able to dislocate their shoulder voluntarily. And the beginning of the initial symptoms is quite young, around 11 to 15 years. So if we want to classify these types of functional shoulder instability, there's two big groups. There's positional functional shoulder instability, and then there is non-positional functional shoulder instability. And essentially, this goes in all directions, anterior, posterior, or multidirectional. So let's start off with positional shoulder instability, and there is a controllable version of this positional instability. If you look at this patient, she has a very nice shoulder motion. There's no sign of instability. However, if she wants to, she can change her muscle activation pattern, and you will see in a second how she is able to dislocate her shoulder at will. This is a position-depending but controllable functional shoulder instability, as you can clearly see on the fluoroscopic images. Let's move to the other version of positional functional shoulder instability. This is the non-controllable version. You can see this patient. She dislocates every time she elevates her arm, and she cannot control it. And you can clearly also see this on the fluoroscopic images. So it's the same pathology as I just showed before. However, she cannot control it. Then there is the other big group called non-positional functional shoulder instability. Again, there is the distinguishment between controllable and non-controllable subtypes of non-positional instability. You can see a patient who can control how she dislocates her shoulder at the neutral position. So she doesn't have to move her arm, yet she can dislocate her shoulder posteriorly quite easily, as you can see on the video and on the fluoroscopic images. At the same time, unfortunately, there is a non-controllable version of this pathology. And you can see this in this patient. Uh, if she only releases her arm from her stomach or from her belly, she continues to have repetitive dislocations, which she cannot control. It almost looks like a tick-like pathology. So what about the direction of this instability? As these patients are usually referred as uh, multidirectional instability cases, as they look very weird if you look at them in a clinical perspective. But if we actually took a case series of more than 30 patients of, uh, uh, that suffer from this pathology and analyzed them under fluoroscope, what we saw is that the majority of the patients were multidirectionally lax. And uh, Philippe Valenti is going to talk about this uh, later on. However, most of them had a unidirectional instability and dislocation direction. The most important thing is that there's a big difference in clinical presentation between the controllable conditions and the non-controllable conditions. If you look at the impairment these patients suffer from, as long as this is controllable, they do not suffer almost at all. They have no limitations in their daily activities and sports activities. However, once these pathologies turn non-controllable, these patients, these often young patients, suffer extensively. 
So in the past, we shoulder surgeons uh, have claimed these patients to be crazy. And this has been written in black and white in several publications. So what we did is we tried to analyze the same cohort of patients, more than 30 patients suffering from functional shoulder instability with a psychological screening score. And what we found is that these patients have no change psychological attitude towards a control group. So this obviously is a very, sorry about that, is a very debilitating pathology in the young, but nonetheless, it is not their fault in terms of this being a psychiatric disease, which has been claimed in the past. However, it might still be caused by a brain malfunction. So there has been a very nice study was conducted in Great Britain where they looked at the brain activation pattern in patients suffering from functional shoulder instability. And what they found is that these patients suffer from an activation pattern very similar to toddlers. They're trying to learn a new motor task. So what can we do for these patients? If it's controllable, don't do anything. Just counsel a patient and tell them not to stress this instability because it might turn into a non-controllable situation. If you have a non-controllable condition, surgery should not be the primary option as the outcome might be good, but it also might be terrible and cause severe pain and early degenerative changes. It's not predictable, essentially. So physiotherapy remains the gold standard. There's another option, which is skillful neglect, because we realized that physiotherapy, unfortunately, in many cases did not lead to the results that we desired. So in other uh, cases and other studies, they figured out that this is a pathology of the young and that might that diminish over time over the decades. But typically, these young patients don't want to wait for 20 years until they get better. They want a solution now and want to return to their lives, uh, which is why, uh, together with an Italian company, we developed an electrical muscle stimulator that is uh, triggered by motion in order to try to treat these patients suffering from functional shoulder instability, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a few seconds. So the gold standard for treatment of functional shoulder instability is still non-operative treatment. And this needs to be very specific, dedicated exercise protocols, enabling uh, to activate hypoactive muscle groups and to deactivate hyperactive muscle groups. So how can this be done? This is just an example of a patient with a positional functional shoulder instability. You can clearly see how she dislocates posteriorly. She cannot even return her arm back uh, down because she is dislocated. And if you use a device, the so-called shoulder pacemaker, which is motion activated and stimulates the hyperactive muscles based on the position of the arm in space, you can see how her shoulder is able to recenter and she doesn't dislocate anymore. How does this look for the patient that we already saw? You can see that she is outside of the regular movement pattern with her scapular kinematics when she is unstable. So what you can do is you can actually use this motion triggered electrical muscle stimulator and you can do very dynamic exercises. And while she's doing her exercises, you can see how you're able to return her scapular kinematics within a normal range pattern. And at the beginning, I thought this needs to be an implantable device. However, we figured out that after a certain period of training, something changes. It might be a neuroplastic effect in the brain that allows these patients to learn the new muscle activation pattern. And this leads to improved outcome. We saw in a randomized controlled trial that compared the shoulder pacemaker versus conventional physiotherapy, that there is an improved outcome if you use the motion-triggered electrical muscle stimulator with better VOSI score, better stability, less discomfort, higher subjective improvement and patient satisfaction. And even if the patients crossed over from the physiotherapy group to the shoulder pacemaker aided physiotherapy group, we saw a significant improvement in these patients. This is an example of a patient uh, three months after conventional physiotherapy, and she did not do very well. She was still unstable. So we switched her, we crossed her over to the other treatment arm, and this treatment arm consists of the exact same physiotherapeutic exercises, but with concomitant stimulation uh, using the shoulder pacemaker. And what we found is that at the six point time mark, you can see how she does much better and is able to return to sports quite nicely. And this is sustained over the one year period. And she sent us this video proving that she is doing better and having a stable shoulder. So what about non-positional functional shoulder instability? Uh, this is a very, very difficult topic for me. And uh, for, for many years, I've been struggling with this and I still continue to struggle with it. So this is a patient 
with static anterior inferior dislocation. You can clearly see this also on the clinical images. Our shoulder is anterior inferiorly dislocated. And this is after two times failed arthroscopic anterior banquet repair. Or actually, it was an anterior and anterior inferior and posterior inferior capsular shift procedure. So she had extensive surgery twice. It did not help. She has the static dislocations now since a long time period. What is amazing about this case is if you now push the humeral head into the socket again and just grab her pectoralis major and pinch it really hard and then release the arm again, her shoulder magically recenters and she's not able to dislocate it anymore. And our neurologist actually saw an increased activation pattern of the pectoralis major pass abdominalis in positions where it should not be firing. So, and the most interesting part about this case was that before surgery, what you can see is if you pull on the arm, it dislocates, but if you release the arm, it just recenters automatically. So this also seems to be a muscle activation pattern issue, even though these patients obviously also had the glenoid defect as was seen and visible on the preoperative x-rays. I encountered another one of these cases not so much time ago, you can see this patient that had a static anterior dislocation after twice failed Bankert and Latage procedure. You can see her humeral head riding on the Latage. And what I do here is I try to recenter the humeral head with my fingers. And you can see how her pectoralis major is trying to pull out the humeral head very hard as I'm trying to, to push against it. And there is a very nice publication, a couple of years old, published in the JSCS coming from a Scandinavian uh, group. No, it's actually from the United Kingdom. Sorry about that. And what they showed, and this is amazing, is they had these patients with static anterior dislocation and they injected some Botox into the pectoralis major. And what you, what is the outcome you can see on the, on the images right below? They recentered a static dislocated joint with Botox. So I tried this with these patients as well, because I wanted obviously to test if this works in my hands as well. And you can see the MRI scan of this patient, which shows uh, a center joint, at least for a short period of time. So in summary, functional shoulder instability is much more common than we expected. And functional shoulder instability can truly result in severe instability, despite hardly any structural defects visible on MRI or CT scan. Often this pathology is misinterpreted as multidirectional instability when reality is a multidirectional laxity with unidirectional instability. And functional shoulder instability, in my opinion, should be treated by addressing muscle hyperactivity and hyperactivity first by using new therapy concepts before deploying the traditional surgical stabilization techniques that we use and love for structural shoulder instability. Thank you very much. Due cose, la prima devo chiederle se può um, gentilmente anche lei attendere perché alla fine facciamo uh, sicuramente delle domande e la seconda, una curiosità personale, e questo trattamento col Botox ogni quanto va ripetuto perché è chiaro che si assorbe, no? So to be honest, I don't have an expensive experience with these uh, patients because they are not so frequent, luckily but uh, typically it wears off after a few months. So this is more used as a diagnostic test. Okay. If it works, then you might consider releasing these muscles via surgical intervention if you're not able to hyperactivate it uh, via some kind of physiotherapeutic intervention. Benissimo, benissimo. E, quindi anche lei attende um, naturalmente il giro successivo di domande e adesso il um, uh, dottor Filippo Valenti um, che dal 1985 ha iniziato la sua esperienza di chirurgia della spalla. Buonasera, um, buonasera dottore. Uh, prima uh, lei ha lavorato, mi sente? Ci sente? Allora, ha lavorato con Didier Pat, fondatore del European Shoulder Society, eh, poi all'interno del SOS Main Clinic di Parigi, eh, da lui fondata nel 1990 e poi presso Land Institute dal 1995. Lei è un eh, grande esperto di chirurgia protesica e ha creato nel 2003 la chirurgia universale della spalla, la chirurgia 
artroscopica per lo sport e le patologie degenerative. Eh, il dottor Valenti lavora presso l'Istituto Parigino di Spalla eh, e ha anche un sito web che spiega tutte le moderne tecniche di chirurgia della spalla come l'artroscopia, le protesi e i transfer tendinei. Dottor Di Giacomo. Beh, intanto Filippo ti volevo ringraziare, io ho il privilegio di aver imparato tanto dal dottor Filippo Valenti che reputo un amico e ho avuto il privilegio di incontrarlo spesso nei posti più disparati eh, del mondo, ultimamente ci siamo visti a Salt Lake City e qualche eh, due o tre mesi fa durante l'American Academy eh, a Las Vegas. Ti do il benvenuto e ti ringrazio sempre per la tua disponibilità a insegnarci qualcosa. Grazie e prego con la relazione Filippo. Thank you very much uh, Giovanni and uh, thank you for TV Shoulder because this is a very nice uh, opportunity to learn and to progress, to evaluate your result and uh, thank you for all the organization. I will share my, uh, my slides. Do you hear me, uh, Giovanni? Is it okay, Giovanni? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, today, today I talk about a difficult problem in the shoulder instability. No, le, le slide non si vedono, le slide non si vedono. Sorry, sorry, I share. Okay. Ora ah, sì. Adesso sì. Perfetto. Perfect, thank you. Okay, this is a difficult problem when... Uh, you examine a patient with a instability of the shoulder on hyperlaxity. This is my disclosure. It's the reason why my outline today is to define instability and to define hyperlaxity, mm -hmm. to explain my clinical examination and uh, the treatment options. So if you talk about instability, instability is a subluxation or dislocation. This is a pathological Uh, fact and uh, instability could be unidirectional, anterior, posterior, inferior. Sometimes this is bidirectional, anterior, inferior, or posterior, inferior. And very rare, this is a multidirectional instability, 2-5%. And uh, with this body, for example, with uh, anterior it sucks, posterior it sucks, and the uh, bony lesion. So, if you talk about hyperlaxity, it's not pathological, but it's frequently because it's 10% of the population, mainly is a female, adolescent, teenager, and there is a familial history. The definition is an excessive range of motion in all the planes because there is a distension of the capsule and ligaments increasing the volume of the joint. And if you are hyperlax, you have a risk of instability. And it is very important for the treatment that instability is combined with hyperlaxity in 5 to 50%. If we talk about the clinical examination of hyperlaxity, the definition of anterior hyperlaxity is the external rotation in position one is more than 85 degrees or 90 degrees. It was defined by Gilles Valch a long time ago. If you have a circle sign in neutral rotation, you have inferior hyperlaxity on Philip show many cases like that. Posterior instability with a JER test positive. Sometimes there is a bidirectional instability, anterior on inferior or posterior on inferior. Very rare, but there is some case like that, a multidirectional hyperlaxity, more than two direction of hyperlaxity. I show you this case. You see that there is hypermobility. The patient is asymptomatic. There is no, not pathological. There is a very high capsular redundancy in many directions, of course doesn't need any treatment, no arthroscopy, no capsular shift, no bony graft. It is not pathological. And I think that we have to 
divide hyperlaxity because the treatment is completely different. There is a the group of constitutional hyperlaxity. If this hyperlaxity is isolated to one shoulder, many times two shoulder, the elbow, you can treat this patient. But if there is a general hyperlaxity that Ehlers Danlos syndrome or hypermobility uh, structural disorder, this is a very risky patient. And take care when you propose a treatment for this kind of patient because the result is less predictable. Another group that you, you know very well, the tennis player, the overhead athlete, you have, after many years of sports, you have acquired hyperlaxity with sometimes an instability. And this is not a risky patient, but we have to treat soft tissue plus bony lesion. So characterized anatomical uh, lesion of this patient with instability on hyperlaxity, there is no major glenoid bone loss. Sometimes there is heel sac lesion, but the problem is a soft tissue for this patient. There is a hypoplastic labrum, glenoid dysplasia, no concavity. Many times there is a convex mole. There is an enlarged capsule volume. And sometimes you have a slap lesion or tear of the labrum. Another point very important is that for inferior succession with inferior or anterior hyperlaxity with a sulcus sign, the patients complain with a brachial plexus stretching. And this is a big problem for the young patient with a dysesthesia in the hand. And when you reduce the sub inferior subluxation, you reduce the black brachial plexus stretching. So hyperlaxity, if you consider the treatment of the shoulder instability, is a predictive factor of failure of soft tissue repair. And is very is a crucial when you do examination of an instable shoulder to evaluate if the patient is hyperlax or not hyperlax. So there is two group of patients if we talk about the treatment. If you have instability with uh, hyperlaxity isolated, I think that if you reduce the capsule, if you restore the concavity to repair the labrum, and after to avoid recurrence, because this is hyperlax and instable, is recommended to do additional stabilizator. You can augment the capsule with a tendon. You can close the rotator interval, or you can use a tria procedure or latage procedure, and you can obtain a success result of 90%. If you don't do additional augmentation, if you have a hyperlax with anterior instability, the risk of recurrence is uh, around 50%. So this is a very difficult problem. And uh, I think that take care for this kind of patient. If you have Marfan or Ehlers syndrome, whatever you do, the success is less predictable. I show you here a case of a conservative. And I think that the most important is to propose a conservative treatment. And uh, Philippe uh, Moroder explained very well the shoulder pacemaker. And always for this kind of patient, I try physiotherapy, shoulder pacemaker. And after, if I have a failure, I try to do a pancapsular shift arthroscopy with a capsular augmentation and, or bone block. But many times in my experience, it's not successful. And I have some patients I, I propose after two or three surgery, arthrodesis of, or reverse arthroplasty. I show you a catastrophic case of me, uh, 21 years old, Eder Danlos syndrome, hyperlaxity, anterior stability. I did a latarge arthroscopy with Bancart. And after a few months, you see that there is a inferior subluxation and posterior subluxation on this location. I did a posterior bone graft. It's not enough. The patient was complained always with painful and I propose after a fusion of the glenoid joint. 
So this is a, we have some case like that on the take care when you treat this kind of patient. If you have a instability with a isolated laxity, I think that you try always conservative treatment and uh, after a failure, you can do a capsular shift on the augmentation with a tria in my experience when there is an anterior inferior instability with hyperlaxity or later J. So I will, would like to show you this patient. It's, it's, it's typical. You see, very young woman. She has a dyskinesia of the scapula on the posterior dislocation of the shoulder. Look at this position. There is a correction of the posterior stability. There's a correction of the posterior stability. And it's very important. My message is when you have a patient with a posterior instability on hyperlaxity, you have to examine the scapula because many times there is a dyskinesia of the scapula. The cause is sometimes a pectoris minor hyperactivity. I agree with Philip regarding the pectoris major, but many times hypoactivity of the lower trapezius on infraspinatus. And this is a typical case that don't do any operation. Physiotherapy, shoulder pacemaker device. And in 90% of my experience, you treat this patient and she will be very happy. And I think that we have to consider not the shoulder. You have to consider the scapulothoracic joint, the shoulder, the glenomeral joint, lower trapezius, infraspinatus, and anteriorly pectoris minor and pectoris major. And if you identify all this muscle and all these joint, you have to, you choose a good solution for this patient. So we publish uh, a series of uh, 14 patients with uh, anterior instability, with uh, subluxation or dislocation, and anterior hyperlaxity. We excluded, of course, LR Downer syndrome, and we did uh, capsuloplasty, anterior and inferior, on osteoclasia of the coracoid process. And the coracoid process is lower on medalize to increase the positioning of the conjunct tendon and to reinforce the inferior part of the subscapularis in abduction. This is a very old technique in 1954 uh, by Tria. And uh, I am very happy because I did 14 cases with more follow-up, three years, no recurrent dislocation, good function, no pain. And uh, we can you we can do by arthroscopy with a, on the button on the, with a good uh, healing of the coracoid process. This is a good augmentation of the capsuloplasty for anterior and inferior dislocation when the patient is hyperlax. We reduce uh, the forward elevation 10 degrees on extra rotation. This is the morbidity of this uh, operation. So my recommendation for this pathology and is very risky for us, uh, instability on hyperlaxity, you should always look for hyperlaxity when you do clinical examination of uh, instability of the shoulder, don't take the wrong direction of instability. It's not so easy to do the difference between anterior and posterior instability if the patient is hyperlax. And hyperlax is, for me, is more complicated to examine instability. Keep a place for conservative treatment. Always for adolescent, no painful posterior dislocation with dyskinesia of the scapulothoracic joint with hypo or hyperactivity of the muscle, keep a place for shoulder pacemaker of Philip Moroder. Instability on hyperlaxity isolated, capsuloplasty, capsular shift, repair the labrum, you do a very well bank out and you augment 
soft tissue because it's a pathologic soft tissue. You can augment with a tendon, with a bone, with a plicature of the rotator interval as you want, but is the concept of augmentation is very uh, useful when there is instability or hyperlaxity. And take care to the uh, hypermobility uh, structural disorder, LR download syndrome, Marfan syndrome, because in my hand, there is no reliable solution. Thank you a lot, Giovanni, and I invite you in Paris next year for the arthroplasty shoulder course. Uh, I will do with Marcus and uh, Jean-David. And of course, I invite you uh, to talk about arthroplasty. Thank you a lot. Grazie. Grazie, Filippo. Eccezionale, rimanete ancora 5 minuti che abbiamo il rush finale di domande. Passo... Tre domande. Eh, tre domande. Tre Dai, domande. vai, comincia. Beh, cominciamo con una di quelle domande al dottor... No, Yamamoto. Per me fare una, una domanda al dottor Neo Yamamoto è qualcosa di... Chiaramente è un grosso, grosso onore, oltretutto farle alle 5 di mattina è un onore doppio, quindi la ringrazio di essere rimasto con noi. E, ehm, partiamo da quello che è il concetto che abbiamo visto prima, quindi intanto lo devo ringraziare insieme a lui e al dottor Igito per averci regalato il concetto di Glenoid Track, che oggi insieme all'On Track of Track e insieme al contributo di Steve Burkhardt e del dottor Di Giacomo è diventato uno dei parametri di gold standard di valutazione dell'instabilità che fa parte del nostro quotidiano e quindi diventa interessantissimo. Abbiamo parlato del cut off dell'83% della superficie della glena, con il quale abbiamo impostato tanti dei nostri lavori e dei processi decisionali che portano a decidere appunto quale intervento sia meglio fare sui nostri pazienti. Però abbiamo visto, e questo diventa uno stimolo straordinario, come un concetto già così importantissimo può essere anche migliorato. È stato interessante vedere come ci sono dei parametri eh, di mh, delta di variabilità di questo glenoid track, cioè non è sempre l'83% della superficie della glena e ci sono dei parametri che appunto eh, possono modificarlo a seconda del paziente. Questi tre parametri, se la regia mi manda le slide, corrispondono eh, tanto per iniziare alla posizione dell'arto nello spazio, quindi è l'83% della superficie della glena sì, ma per esempio ad end range il glenoid track diminuisce la sua dimensione. Questo è, è un elemento, un key point determinante, perché ci aiuta a capire quali sono i punti ehm, di, eh, di maggior criticità del movimento del paziente, dove può rischiare di nuovo di andare incontro a una problematica di carattere strutturale. Eh, altro elemento essenziale, Uh, che può variare appunto da paziente a paziente e variare la dimensione del glenoid track e la sua lastità capsulo legamentosa, cioè a seconda del grado di lastità capsulo legamentosa che è totalmente paziente dipendente, il glenoid track può assumere un valore diverso e quindi diminuire eh, la sua dimensione. Questo diventa importantissimo perché nel processo decisionale che porta un paziente a una chirurgia rispetto all'altra sono dei parametri che probabilmente vanno indagati a livello anche di classificazione. Terzo e ultimo parametro con cui, di cui discutiamo con lei è anche la posizione della scapola toracica perché in effetti il rapporto è di glenomerale, quindi è della testa dell'omero sulla glena. Ma la glena può avere posizioni diverse, può avere comportamenti, come ha detto chiaramente Philippe Moroder, che è un grande esperto, dal punto di vista funzionale può modificare il suo comportamento rispetto alla testa dell'omero. E questo potrebbe essere un altro parametro importante nella valutazione dei nostri pazienti, anche per capire in termini previsionali quale sarà l'outcome di riuscita nel post chirurgico. Allora lì arrivo alla domanda... Dove so, so, sono orientati i vostri studi? Ci faccio uno spoiler da questo punto di vista. Dove sta andando la letteratura? Yes, thank you for your uh, question. And uh, it's a very good point. And uh, as you said, the granular track is affected by the joint laxity and the range of motion. And uh, we need to consider the especially laxity, and uh, to investigate the relationship between granular track and the range of motion or joint laxity. And uh, we uh, measure the uh, granular track virus uh, changing the uh, range of motion. And uh, among various range of motion, the, we found horizontal extension is affect 
the granular track we use most. We did an in vivo study and biomechanical study. We did both. And uh, we found horizontal extension motion affects the granular track most. Then we made a granular track table which showed the relationship between granular track wheels and the horizontal extension angle. For example, if one patient has a 10 degree of a horizontal extension angle, his granular track wheels is 81%, uh, something like that. Then by using this granular track table, we are able to know the individual granular track wheels. So we propose the granular track wheels uh, in clinical use. It's very simple and easy to use. Grazie. Grazie. Allora, passiamo a un'altra domanda che faccio al nostro amico francese, eh, Philippe Valenti, in quanto la Francia sono, eh, diciamo, dei grossi fautori della tecnica di laser -G. La tecnica di laser -G, eh, si utilizza tendenzialmente, ma non solo, nei importanti bone loss, nel critical bone loss che è oltre il 20-25% e sfrutta una serie di effetti che funzionano sia nel mid range che nell'end range che sono sia chiaramente il supporto del trapianto come piattaforma ossa ma importantissimo è lo sling effect cioè questa compressione del sotto eh, scapolare eh, dovuta al eh, tendine comune che in abduzione e rotazione esterna stabilizza la spalla la domanda che io voglio fare parte dal ricordare il concetto introdotto da Tokish, che è quello del subcritical glenoid bone loss. Tokish ha fatto una serie di lavori, una in particolare, in cui ha descritto subcritical glenoid bone loss. Che cosa dice Tokish in questo lavoro? Che se noi facciamo in soggetti che fanno i militari, tipo i Marines, o in sport da contatto, una bank art repair, in soggetti che hanno un glenoid bone loss tra il 13 e il 5% e il 20%, non aumentano le recidive, ma i luosi è intorno a 500-600, cioè il risultato clinico non è buono. La domanda che io vi faccio è questa. Allora, com'è possibile che nei, nei chirurghi che amano come tecnica invece della laser -G, il bone block, e vi faccio vedere questo filmato, Cosa succede? Il bone block, e questo ce lo insegna Yamamoto e Iji, l'osso funziona come stabilizzatore nel, med, nel mid range. Ma chi utilizza il bone block poi ripara la bank art, chiaramente su un deficit osso importante che potrebbe essere un subcritical glenoid bone loss. Quindi un'altra volta la capsula viene riparata su un glenoid bone loss del 16-17%, quindi viene rimessa in tensione. Siccome all'end range of motion funziona solo la capsula, com'è possibile che questi soggetti che fanno la bank art e il graft osseo abbiano dei uosi buoni? Se compariamo questi lavori con quello di John Tokish. È una domanda un po' complessa, un po' articolata, però per me è molto importante perché il bone block correttamente sta prendendo estremamente piede. Ma quello che io vi chiedo in sintesi, riparando la bank art su comunque un subcritical glenoid bone loss, che questa è l'indicazione del bone block, quindi riparare una capsula, una bank art lesion, su un 16% di glenoid bone loss, non può portare comunque all'end range of motion un limite dell'articolarità, quindi un wasi non buono, nonostante ci sia un bone block che funziona nel mid range. Filippo, chi di voi mi può dare una risposta o ha qualche dubbio su questo che io ho detto? No, but uh, we have to, to come back to the history of the, of the Latarge. Because uh, when I learned with Didier Pad by Open Technique in 1985, we shutter the capsule to the, the stamp of the AC ligament. We didn't do any bone cart. We put the capsule to the AC ligament of the coracoid block. And I think that is completely different, that if you do a bone block coracoid process on the bone cart, 
because of course, as you explained very well, that you repair the bank card medially and you limit the excursion of your capsule. And if you compare the result of, uh, for example, our friend Laurent Lafosse, Laurent Lafosse does a, a lethargy and he removed completely the capsule. He didn't do any bank card. And uh, this is not my way. I prefer to do a bone card to be extra articular for the bone and to avoid osteoarthritis. But when you compare the post-operative uh, follow-up of my patient on the patient of Laurent, Laurent, the patient recover very early a good range of motion. In my patients, I have 10 degrees of limitation of exer rotation if I compare to the contralateral side. And I think that I am not sure today that the bone card procedure, if you have a bone loss than 20%, is a good way. I prefer today a suture of the capsule to the AC ligament by arthroscopy because I think it depends on the bone loss. For the rugby player, for example, for the rugby player, in my experience, if you have no bone loss, I do a latarge plus a bone card procedure with a very nice result. But if the rugby player has a bone loss around 20% with a heel sax lesion, I prefer to do a latarge with a suture of the bone card, with a suture of the capsule to the AC ligament. This is my answer today, but uh, I'm not sure that it's a good way, but uh, is logical not to stretch too much uh, the the capsule because I think that if you if you check postoperatively after three months, many times there is a rupture of the capsule. If you tie too much the capsule during the operation. Grazie. Filippo Moroder, tu hai qualcosa da aggiungere su, io no, non so, eh, in questo tipo di subcritica al glenoid bone loss, tu fai la tergia o fai il bone block? Se fai il bone block, ripari la capsula sul glenoid bone loss? Qual è la tua filosofia? So my opinion is that if you perform a free bone block uh, graft transfer, then actually you should not refix the capsule between the graft and the native glenoid. So you should not put the graft extra thickly for the exact reason that you just mentioned, because otherwise the capsule might be too short and limit range of motion. Uh, it's actually that my first teacher, Herbert Resch, he performed free bone uh, transfer since many, many decades. And we have 15 years outcome. We have randomized controlled trials comparing his technique to Latage's at five year time point. He never fixed any capsule at all. He just let it go. He just cut it and let it be. And he has the same outcome as, as you can get with the Latache. So actually it does not seem so important in a patient with a critical or subcritical bone loss to fix the capsule. And if you do fix it, fix it around the graft. Don't fix it at the interface between the graft and the native glenoid. Otherwise you will restrict motion. And you don't need to be worried as much about osteoarthritis, I think. There's a very nice study coming out of Austria, Salzburg. Uh, Alexander Aufwart has shown with MRI scans that if you have an intraticular graft, uh, after one year, you have a remodeling of the surface and there is all, there is fibrous cartilage formation. We even took histological samples of a bone graft in case of revision. And you cannot see these grafts uh, being uh, not covered. They are covered by some form of fibrous cartilage. And so it does not seem to be deleterious for instability or tropathy in the long range. So it can stay intraticularly but you need to be careful to make the concavity very precise. So you need to reconstruct the concavity and you don't need to have any step-offs, obviously. Perfetto. Allora, prima di salutarci, Filippo, una domanda che non possiamo andare noi a dormire e eh, Yamamoto a lavorare senza una chicca sull'instabilità posteriore. Prego. Quindi chiaramente le sue linee guida e le sue indicazioni sul trattamento dell'instabilità posteriore sono determinanti nella nostra pratica clinica. E quindi le porto un caso clinico, donna, 19 anni, eh, giocatrice e professionista 
di pallavolo. Questa ragazza viene da noi con una diagnosi di instabilità posteriore funzionale, ma all'imaging esce fuori questo quadro eh, diagnostico eh, di glena piatta, quindi un difetto anche strutturale della porzione posteriore della glena. Ora la mia domanda è, eh, questi tipi di pazienti oltretutto così giovani, oltretutto dedicati allo sport, possiamo realisticamente aiutarli dal punto di vista riabilitativo con un trattamento come lei ci ha insegnato, oppure vanno demandati qual è il cut off entro il quale possiamo lavorare conservativamente, oppure vanno demandati alla chirurgia e se sì cosa proporrebbe dal punto di vista chirurgico? Thank you very much, this is a very interesting case and this is, a, if you maybe are able to put the slide back up showing the image of the MRI scan, I think this is a very important point. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this. Ah, perfect, thank you very much. So if you look closely at these MRI scans, you can clearly see that it's true what just has been said. This is a very flat, glenoid uh, surface and talking about the bony surface. It might even be convex if you look at the right image. However, usually what you can find in these cases is a quite hypertrophic posterior cartilage or posterior labrum that compensates for this displacure, for this bony displacure. So also in this case, in the end, you can see, even though the bone is convex almost, you can still have a concavity by the fact that the posterior labrum is compensating for that. But admittedly, still the glenoid remains quite flat. So there is a structural insufficiency. That's not a structural defect in terms of a, a damage that was obtained by trauma, but it's more uh, insufficiency. So in my hands, this is a clear indication for a non-operative treatment attempt for three to six months. In my hands, it's the shoulder pacemaker device that I would use. If it leads to stability, great. You don't need to worry about it anymore. If it leads to instability, Uh, and it doesn't, um, does, get, doesn't treat, is not able to treat and stabilize the patient. Then in this particular case, I would go in the direction that Philippe Valenti has shared with us. I would go for minimally invasive arthroscopic capsule label repair and shift. It's actually not a repair. It's more a shift because it's not torn. And then after six weeks after the intervention, I would add the functional treatment because for sure, if you just operate and you don't do any adequate physiotherapy, you're not tackling the cause. So the surgery in this particular case becomes the helper of the non-operative treatment. So you need to combine both. Perfetto. Grazie. Allora, prima di lasciare la parola a Vira che conclude, io ci tenevo a ringraziare personalmente Filippo eh, Valenti, Filippo Moroder, il nostro amico Nobu Yamamoto e ringraziare Shoulder Pacemaker, Top Doctors e IGEA che dietro le quinte sono sempre una mano forte, che ci danno la possibilità di fare questo sharing of culture al quale noi di Shoulder Channel teniamo tanto. Quindi grazie ai nostri amici scienziati e grazie chiaramente a chi ci permette tutto questo. Prego Vira. Bene, grazie. Io volevo concludere ringraziando tutti quanti voi che naturalmente avete dato questo importantissimo contributo scientifico, ringraziare il, ringraziando il dottor Giovanni Di Giacomo, naturalmente anche Elena Uh, Silvestri e a questo punto che dire buonanotte lei il dottore può, <ride> può continuare a dormire tranquillamente e buonanotte a tutti alla Goodbye. prossima <ride> Goodbye. Thank you. alla prossima buonanotte. ciao buonanotte. grazie Filippo grazie Filippo <ride> grazie Nobu thank, thank you very much thank you. <ride> thank you all the team thank you <ride> thank you guys bye 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 ciao bye. <ride> Ciao, grazie anche al nostro traduttore. Mandiamo la ah, pubblicità. Ah, è vero, grazie. Così la ringraziamo.
Thank you.